Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, here we are again for Batwoman Season 1, Episode 13, Drink Me, which is about a vampire. Hey, well, sort of, anyway. Uh, vampire, Episode 13. Huh, what are the odds, right? As a non-spoiler review, I can say that this episode really just cemented Batwoman as having reached Plan 9 from Outer Space level stupidity. <laughs> Um, you know, go ahead and watch this thing, but watch it for friends and just watch it for the laughs. You know, laugh at this because it really is becoming so bad that it's good. Last week, if you watched my review, I practically I lose my, lost my lunch and how stupid it is. And it would be really easy to become enraged by it, just pissed off. But I can no longer do that. It is just too damned funny how dumb it is. So, unlike most reviewers, I usually don't just walk through the plot and talk about things I disliked. Uh, I will often go through, you know, acting, directing, cinematography, things that go into mechanics of making a film. But I don't do that with this stupid show um, because you really don't, shouldn't spend any real time analyzing this level of stupid. In any case, we will take it as read that you've either watched Batwoman Season 1, Episode 13, or that you don't care that if it's spoiled for you, but just to be on the safe side, we should issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. But that's not a boast or a brag, that's actually where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see this new stuff for the century that came before. That makes us cursed. It sometimes interferes with our ability to enjoy things. But you know what? You don't have to be a fan die master to enjoy the hideous Plan 9 from outer space stupidity that is Batwoman. And one thing I do not do, I want to make clear real right off the bat, I don't do outrage videos because there are a lot of reviewers who are simply actors. They're portraying outrage because they found out after The Last Jedi that outrage tends to sell. But they reflex hate everything because the viewers want to see them hate things. And this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and reviewers where essentially everybody ends up not being able to enjoy anything, even if it's any good. So I don't do outrage. If I like, if I like something, I'll tell you why. If I don't, I'll tell you why. But I don't do outrage because unlike these other reviewers, I am the adult in the room. Okay, well again, I often usually in most of my reviews go into a lot more depth, but um, you know, that will kind of doing that kind of depth, doing that kind of research usually eat up a couple of hours and, and, and you know, I have to do some kind of commentary, write a script on it, and no, no, <laughs> Batwoman is too stupid. It is not worth that amount of effort. It is always nothing but gigantic cringe moments unless, like me, you have decided that this is the modern plan day, modern day plan nine from outer space, and it's just time to laugh at it. Um, you know, it would probably make me angry like it did last time, but what's the point? This is too dumb. It should never be taken seriously. The, the difference between this and the 1960s Batman series is that they think they're making, you know, real good work. It's, it's why it's Plan 9, is because you have a bunch of people who are doing their level damn best, and their level damn best comes out stupid. <laughs> but it is crap every time, and it's Plan 9 from outer space all over again. The only thing to do is just to laugh at it, because it is becoming so bad that it's good in every single episode. Now, I usually do try to say something good about the episode, no matter how much it's like Plan 9 from outer space. I usually call these great moments. Um, but they're not really great in this show. The best you can say that they are is okay. So my okay moments, um, one of them really was the fact that Mary had finally figured out that Kate is Batwoman. That's a good move, uh, considering that the information necessary to do this had been staring her in the face since about the first time she met Batwoman. 
Um, and seriously, this is just some Plan 9 level of plotting and characterization. <laughs> the only difference is that they have a very large budget and damn near everything is shot in complete darkness, which is where we get into the cringe moments because it's shot in near complete darkness. Now, I watched the show twice. I always watch anything I'm going to review twice, no matter how stupid it is. In this case, I watched twice just to write down all the cringe. I always watch it twice, twice, and uh, the first time, in this case, I was watching it um, on the CW as it aired, which I always found incredibly irritating because there are so many commercials. I, I, I get my uh, entertainment on this via a number of different other streaming ways, none of which cost any money. Um, so I have become unused to the amount of commercials, but that actually worked out well because at the same time I was working on my script for my Doctor Who review that came out yesterday. So every time a commercial came up for like, you know, eight minutes, I could sit down and go down and work on my script. But when I watch it the second time, I usually watch it in a way that's showing up on my VLC media player, and I have to kick that sucker up the brightness on it, 20%, in order to have any kind of statistical probability of even following the action. So those of you who are watching it um, as it airs, uh, it, it, it does better if you can really kick up the brightness. Try doing that. So getting into the cringe moments themselves. So if Nocturna, hey, a.k.a. Natalia Knight, get it? Knight? Got that? She's got these fangs, this you know, dental appliance that can inject ketamine. Um, how does she avoid getting that in her own mouth? I mean, how does that work exactly? I mean, they're not real teeth, so how does this injection system even work? Well, of course, the answer is it works because of plot. Uh, also, this one's pretty hot, so she should really have no, pick, no problem picking up guys. There's really no reason for her ever to do anything except uh, pick up guys. She can leave them dying or dead in their own beds. You don't have to hang people in order to bleed to them out. If, if, it, if that was necessary, lots of people would die who don't. I mean, or wouldn't die who do. Hanging is not necessary to bleed someone out. You just, you know, bite them. They are then in a way that they can't move anymore. They just leave, leave them on the bed. Why do you have to hang them up? And, um, you know, that just doesn't make any sense. Now, the biggest thing, the biggest level of stupid in this whole thing is the opening of the episode. Now, it makes no damn sense whatsoever, given where we left these characters at the end of the last episode. Because when we last saw Beth, she was dead in Luke's arms. Sophie was on sight with a sniper rifle, and the crows were on their way for backup. Now, Sophie knows exactly who Luke is. I mean, even if, you know, she just, even if he just dropped, Al, you know, uh, Beth's dead body and took off on the bat bike, Sophie now knows that Luke is involved with who she thinks is Alice. So why the frack didn't cro the crows not pick up Luke? For questioning, he is obviously some kind of accomplice. It's dumb. When we last saw Alice, she was chained up to a bed in an un illegal, unsanitary, unlicensed cl clinic run by a med student without a license to practice medicine. What did Kate do here? I mean, did she, did she let her go again? Why would she do that? I mean, Alice is still a serial killer. And as this episode shows, she's outright insane now. You know what we're talking to a man again. <laughs> what, what did she do? I mean, at worst, Kate should have just stuck her in a cell in the Batcave. Although why Batman ever had cells is completely beyond me. You would not want to bring crooks into the Batcave because, might you know, particularly when it's sitting underneath the, the giant Wayne Tower. That's kind of a dead giveaway, you know, as to who the hell is operating this thing. And Mary, of course, she knew exactly where Alice was because she was the one who left her chained up to that bed. Now, admittedly, Mary does run a <laughs> an illegal, unsanitary, unlicensed clinic run by her with no license to practice medicine. So maybe she decided leading the serial killer chained to the bed was preferable to her going to jail for running an illegal, unsanitary, unlicensed clinic without any license to practice medicine. <laughs> 
In any case, Kate should have kept the cuffs on Alice and trust her up somewhere for the GCPD or for the crows to find. And even if the crows, you know, even if they find and get her right, then they have this dead body already. Somebody is going to come checking for Alice and discover she's a dead ringer, right? So no doubt they'd check her fingerprints or DNA or retina scans and find out that she is, in fact, a genetic exact duplicate for Beth, leaving him in a weird and generally inexplicable situation. And Jacob Payne might well have something to say about this, considering that he has an exact duplicate of his daughter in the morgue and another in custody. But I guess Alice just let Kate just let Alice go because of plot. <laughs> and the last we saw of Jacob Kane, he was bleeding out of the bathroom due to blunt force trauma to the head and multiple stab wounds to the abdomen. This is just not something you walk off. This puts you in the hospital for a long time, even assuming that you don't bleed out, and Jacob was in a very large puddle of blood, and he had was not in any shape to take himself to the prison hospital or anywhere. Uh, he should have just bled out right there. <laughs> but even assuming that he got medical attention, he should have undergone multiple life-threatening surgeries to repair all of the damaged organs that had been punctured or severed by multiple stab wounds to the abdomen, if at least had a concussion, if not an outright cracked skull. <laughs> You just don't walk this off. <laughs> and why did they exonerate Jacob anyway? Supposedly they were only going to do that unless Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, gave some kind of recommendation about the possibility of Mouse doing what they said Mouse had done, but that doesn't seem to have happened. Maybe, maybe somebody finally just checked his credit card record and found out that he'd been out of town spending money on that credit card during the entire incident where Catherine had been killed. Maybe somebody would have checked the security footage on the various motels or hotels that he was staying at and seen him. Maybe somebody would have finally looked at the phone records that he'd been making calls from out of town during the time in question. I don't know. I guess they just exonerate him because of plot. The last we saw of Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, Sophie could see him from where he shot Beth. Now, why did Sophie make absolutely no attempt to apprehend the Cartwright? I mean, he was right there. Well, I guess she did it because of plot. And the last we heard of Kate, it was only a matter of time before the elevator to the Batcave was discovered because the crows were ransacking Bruce's office. Well, I guess they didn't ransack it as thoroughly as Kate thought. Because if, <laughs> It's kind of a shame because if they left Beth in the Batcave rather than taking her out to some motel, Beth would still be alive. Why, by the way, do the morgue consider Beth to be a Jane Doe? Why are they listing her as such? They know she's Beth Kane. Is this some kind of weird cover-up so that nobody knows it's Jacob Kane's daughter? Uh, if so, is the Gotham more engaging in this cover-up, and why? Is it uh, bribery, extortion? Uh, this confirms my statement by, by last week, if so, that the Crows are nothing but a high-tech crime organization now. So, not only did Kate release Alice off-screen, but Alice has a new headquarters in an abandoned mannequin factory. Or maybe it's not abandoned, since there seem to be a hell of a lot of mannequins in it. Usually, when you abandon something, you clear out all of the assets. You know, if you're going bankrupt or something, you sell everything. So if this thing becomes abandoned, it tends to either get stripped for suitable parts and or graffiti is completely out of control everywhere, and you find up everything much more banged up. And Alice is just out a flat-out paranoid schizophrenic now, talking to a mannequin with a face of skin attached to the head, as though if she were responding to her as Mouse. And not only, not, and not that Alice, you know, she's been a complete sociopath, but she was at least in some contact with reality. But one wonders why her gang does consider to continue to hang around her. I mean, they're about one bout of conscience from Beth you know, apprehending Alice and them being arrested and their leader being, is talking to a mannequin. <laughs> Maybe it's just time to find another job with the local mob boss, you know what I'm saying? One of Alice's gang members comes in at one point with a tiny, tiny panda and tells Alice that it was all that was left in the hospital room that Mouse was in. That would be the hospital room that Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Cal Caterpillar, somehow removed Mouse from past one crow guard, at least, off screen and with no explanation last week. So how can Alice's gang get into a formerly occupied hospital room for a search? And by the way, these street thugs can search a small a hospital room so thoroughly as to find a stuffed animal half the size of your palm. 
the crows should be using these guys in their scientific investigation division because they are damned thorough. And by the way, last I knew, most hospital space is at a premium. Rooms don't go unoccupied for very long. It would be more likely that Mouse's room would go to some other patient <laughs> when, they, when it was vacated, meaning that all of Alice's thing, thugs were seeing scourging through an occupied hotel room. I mean, uh, no, hospital room. I mean, that in itself just raises so many questions. But again, this is all Plan 9 from Outer, State, outer Space stuff. Luke gives Kate a locket that he took from Best Body. Okay, let's see if we can get the timeline down here. Sophie was in a sniper position and called for the pro backup, though why, you know, I said it last week, why Beth might be, you know, there and didn't bring like a whole battalion of crows with her in the first place is rather unknown, but she's there. She has Beth in her sights. She knows that Beth is with Luke. So Dr. Cartwright, a.k.a. August Cart. uh, uh uh, sorry, Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, snipes Beth, who dies in Luke's arms in a matter of moments. So Sophie does not attempt to apprehend Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, whom she can see from her position. Uh, Sophie does not attempt to apprehend Luke, as he is clearly Beth's accomplice. Sophie does not make a beeline for Beth's corpse to see if she can render any kind of medical aid. In fact... Apparently, all that Sophie did was sit there long enough for the crow backup to arrive, and it apparently took a little while. In fact, it took so long that Beth had time to fr that Luke rather had time to frisk Beth for any mementos that Kate might want, and um, you know anything that she might want to have. And also, he was able to catch a partial license plate. <laughs> Because Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cat Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, apparently drove off, and there having been no attempt again by Sophie to apprehend him, he drove off in the car and Luke was able to get this partial license plate, so not only did Luke have time to frisk Beth for mementos, but he also had time to glance around for the shooter. Too bad he didn't do anything except, you know, that Sophie didn't do anything except just sit there and wait for the crow backup while observing absolutely nothing. Oh, uh, Luke tells Kate that he think that it, thinks that it's been too serious lately and that Kate should take her mind off of it by doing other things like going after a serial killer whose M.O. is to bleed her victims of all their blood. Because, hey, that's not serious. <laughs> Luke describes Nocturna's M.O. as very early 2000s. Well, I guess he's talking about Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which aired from 1997 to 2003, so I guess you could call that early 2000s. Kate then goes to this club called Curse, and apparently it has or is near something that looks a hell of a lot like a medical lab, and that lab can be viewed from the top of the club, I guess. There are, in that uh, place, six crows in the medical lab, several of whom are visible in Batwoman's background. You can see them in the shots right around her. So it's a damn good thing that the only one who actually saw Sophie was, in Batwoman, was Sophie. And by the way, what is the actual motivation for covering for Batwoman? I mean, is it solely out of physical attraction? Because if so, that's as dumb and as selfish a reason that, you know, Kate is using to constantly fail to apprehend Alice because Alice is her sister, right? So where is Mary, by the way? Where is Mary getting this equipment? Because in another scene, next scene, she's doing a tox screening on... Kate's blood. Where did she get the equipment necessary to perform tox screenings with, for an illegal, unsanitary, unlicensed clinic run by a med student with no, with no license to practice medicine? I mean, that sort of equipment, you know, costs money, and she's by definition not getting any. What is she stealing them from the university or something? Um, so when this tox screen does come back with Kate having ketamine in her bloodstream, Mary naturally assumes that Kate has been using ketamine, whose street name is Special K recreationally. Um, Special K is actually, I don't know, I've never <laughs> tried it, but it's apparently a rave drug, um, making Kate's lame excuse that she's taking real estate classes at night particularly lame, unless real estate developers have a habit of going to raves. <sighs> At least Mary thinks uh, it's weird, which, again, is contributing really to the only non-Plan 9 from Outer Space type uh, action in this episode. 
Then when Kate suggests drawing out Noctura, Luke says, please don't tell me we're going to have a blood draw. Well, actually, to be honest, getting blood from the Red Cross, you know, donation blood draws or hospitals would probably be both a better supply of drugs, uh, of blood rather, and a lot less, you know, out there and public way to obtain it. Um, an adult has about 1.5 gallons of blood. I don't know the figure, but the average hospital must have at least 10 times that. And you don't have to go around killing people and leaving bodies in your wake, which is ultimately going to get you in trouble with the law somewhere down the line. And Jacob Kane, the next scenes, he is sounding like a mob boss now. He's not concerned with his organization acting like a high-tech criminal gang. He's concerned about getting Batwoman off the streets because he's chasing off the company's customer base. You know, I'm just spitballing here, but maybe, maybe if you didn't set illegal chat points, give cavity searches to everyone, and didn't break down doors without so much as a warrant, maybe the locals would be more inclined to hire you. Just a thought. Jacob Kane actually says that the city likes Batwoman because she doesn't subscribe to the rules. Well, if that ain't the pot calling the kettle black. Jacob actually says, quote, let's remind everyone what real authority looks like, end quote. And again, this is sounding more and more just like a mob boss. And where is Gotham's local government and the GCPD while the Crows, a private company, run around kicking names and taking ass? Um, now, <laughs> when Kate mentions, you know, she's going to open her club weeks early, and Jacob asks about that, and Sophie says, quote, Probably not the best time for an opening, considering Noctura's targeting club goers. End quote. Turns out Sophie would be good at cringe moments, because let's be clear, Kate's plan for drawing out Nocturna is to get an entire club's patronage full of innocent people and put their lives in danger. <laughs> and Kate is supposed to be the superhero. And by the way, uh, Sophie refers to Mary's Instagram account as a page rather than an account. It is a small thing, but it's indicative of the writer's unfamiliarity with social media. And in fact, if they were really on top of this, I know, by the way, that they have not gone and made, say, a kind of meta Mary Hamilton account on Instagram for the show, but they really should. And then they should, like, you know, post things that would be consistent with in-universe posts. That would be kind of cool. But of course, they're not that smart. They're making Plan 9 from outer space, for God's sake. After seeing Kate in the outfit she wears to her club opening, I can see why they keep dressing her in oversized jackets and loose clothing and trying to make her look like a guy. Because Ruby Rose is about 5'8", 97 pounds, and even an anorexic on screen, which adds about 10 pounds. So if you let her body be seen with uh, very much without the bat suit, then the audience will probably never believe that she can beat up 200-pound, extremely accommodating stuntmen every week. You know, for somebody who's gone to Kate's opening to keep an eye on things, Soapy sure is dressed to get hit on by everyone there. Her usual crow suit would have been perfectly fine. Mary notices this, by the way. Mary would be good at cringe moments. <laughs> Mary, Sophie, and... Um, the other woman who's hitting on them, they're all talking far too softly. This is a club. I don't know if you've ever been to a club, but it tends to be loud. You can't whisper in a club and be heard. You know, you almost have to get a lot. Some of them, you have to almost get into somebody's ear and scream at them. You also can't whisper into a concealed microphone in the middle of a club and be heard. So, this woman is hitting on Hofi, Sophie, rather, and her family, I caught this, her family used to have security from the crows when she was a kid? This woman has, you know, got to be in her 20s sometime, so how long have the crows been around? It's been a longer since Batman has been gone. And, and I love this, she says that if she's going to root for someone who skirts the law and lacks accountability, it would be Batman woman. Turns out that this woman is extremely good at cringe moments. Oh, Ruby Rose, she continues to be just a block of wood. And this really stacks, six sticks out when she's opening her own club. I mean, she is the owner and the manager, right? Even though she's looking for Nocturna, she should be kind of upbeat for her club's opening. I don't know any managers and owners that run around looking depressed at their own club, much less the opening. But that's Ruby Rose. She's a block of wood. 
And Aunt Mary thinks it's strange for Kate and Luke to be communicating via Bluetooth or radio or something. But it, if you think about it, it's really not all that weird. You know, he's obviously her closest assistant. He's doing stuff for her constantly. So why would he not be communicating with her at the club? You know, one of the few non-plan nine things in this thing. And Mary gets it wrong. And Alice is hanging out in the alley behind the club. And once again, Kate doesn't attempt to apprehend her, making Kate an accessory to Alice's lengthy list of serial murders, assault, property damage, etc. And again, who is who's the hero of this show? The incredibly self-centered and... Now, Kate wants to talk to Alice about what happened, and Alice is all pissed off because of the fact that Kate obviously let her go. And Kate is all on about how she knows now Alice can't be redeemed and how Alice is going to keep killing people, and all Kate lets her do is still walk free. And as always with the CW shows, Alice and Kate stop for a confab, pulling a screeching halt on the brakes to whatever uh, tension might have been building, uh, despite the fact knowing that Nakura is probably in the club or waiting around the club hunting for her next victim. Now, Alice's new lair seems to have a lot of strobe lights, I notice. Uh, personally, I'd find that very, very annoying, and I'd probably replace them. Nocturna's um, adopted father, he died two weeks ago, and then she went on her killing spree. So what was her janitor father doing to keep her alive? Now, this is usually when you have some kind of condition this severe, and I didn't look up to see if this is a real thing, but assuming it is, you get, like, normal medical attention? Uh, so what was she doing prior to starting her killing spree? Who the hell knows? It's Plan 9 from Outer Space, man. And now Batwoman knows where Alice's lair is, and she continues to let Alice go free. And now towards the last, near the end of the episode, thank God, so Batwoman left Alice in her lair, but then Alice shows up moments later after Batwoman and Nocturna have started fighting at the Gotham Cathedral. So did Nocturna tell Alice where she was planning to take Mary? It's plan nine. Um, this Jacob Kane is then bitching to Sophie about how he doesn't trust her anymore, and this really isn't any different from the, what a mob boss would say to one of his underlings. This crows really are a high-tech criminal gang. So after defeating Nocturna, Bad Woman took Mary to Mary's illegal, unsanitary, unlicensed clinic run by a med student with no license to practice medicine and gave her cookies. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better to drop Mary off at a hospital? Where they could have, you know, replaced some of the blood that she lost? It's plan nine. And now, Kate gets a free pass into Alice's lair just by waving at her gang members. She, they're apparently so used to seeing her around that they don't even think twice. Oh, okay, here's a person who could, you know, like spill the beans. You know, who cares? Eh, it's just her. She'll never do anything. <laughs> And Kate yet has another opportunity to apprehend Alice, and this after a whole long speech to Alice about how stupid she's been for believing that Alice could be redeemed. If that's the case, Kate, come in there sometimes, Batwoman, truss her up and leave her for the GCP to, to find, for God's sake. I mean, who is the hero of this show, right? So now, finally, Alice finally decides to blame Dr. Campbell, a.k.a. August Cartwright, a.k.a. Caterpillar, for her problems rather than literally the everyone who had nothing to do with it. Well, let's see how long this particular motivation lasts. Usually they last an episode or less. Now, Mary, as I said, one of the non-cringe moments. Finding out that, figuring, putting it, you know, two and two together after all this time, that Kate is Batwoman... Well, so far, Mary is actually the most heroic and intelligent character in this show. It turns out, I think, that Mary is actually the hero of Batwoman. Then there's that bat signal scene. I mean, okay, wait. Sophie has access to the bat signal? How does that work? And, and also, Batwoman, she doesn't arrive by swinging down from the shadows or even stepping out of the shovel. She, she walks out of a roof entrance to the building. How does she get in the building? And if she can get in the building, why not meet with whoever called her from their office rather than going up to the roof? <laughs> it's plan nine, man. 
And then we have Sophie and Batwoman's sucking face, which is kind of weird, considering that Sophie has no idea who Batwoman is and has been explicitly convinced that it is not Kate. One has to assume at this point that their entire relationship on Sophie's side is just based on nothing but sexual attraction because they don't know each other at all. And that being the case, is the plan for Kate to just wear the bat mask and the cowl while she's sucking face or having sex with Sophie? I mean, how is, is that going to work? Is, he, is she going to take her into her confidence after all that? It's plan nine, man. You know, it, how do you do this, man? You're sucking face with somebody who's got a mask on. And you have no expectation that they're going to take it off. How? What? How? What? It's plan nine. And there is one thing I have to tell you about sucking face and making out and sex. Nobody does it the same. I've been with uh, multiple women and no two of them I would ever mistake for the other. Everybody's individual. So sucking face with Batwoman should instantly clue Sophie in that Batwoman is Kate. And it apparently doesn't because plot. So we have finally, finally come to the end of the cringe moments and stupid from this Plan 9 from Outer Space level crap. At the end of my review, I usually ask, is it any good? Well, yes and no. It really does cement Batwoman as having reached Plan 9 from Outer Space stupidity. I mean, every single episode is like this. All you do is walk through every scene and pick out all the dumb, you know. So do, I, I would say, it's one of the few times I'll say this, it's so stupid, but go ahead, do watch it. Watch it with your friends, and just watch it for the laughs, because it has really gotten to the point where it is so bad that it's good. So, <laughs> that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I'd certainly love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So, next time on the Fandai Masters Review of Batwoman, evil aliens attack Earth and set their terrible Plan 9 into action. Now, as the aliens resurrect the dead of the Earth, the lives of the living are in danger. Plus, I'm really, really gay. That's next time on the Fandai Masters Review of Batwoman. So, thanks for watching. That is all that I have to say about that. <laughs> Again, love to keep the conversation going, but this is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from S.Y.L. Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.